This is the American Greed Podcast presented by CNBC. I'm Stacy Keach. In this episode of American Greed, attorney Eric Kahn is the king of disability law. He was like the Pied Piper because people admired him so much because he was larger than life. Everybody knew that if you needed your Social Security, go to Eric Kahn. He won. He never lost. A shameless self-promoter. You now have Mr. Social Security on your side. If you're a Khan makes millions getting disability payments for his clients. He had a Rolls Royce at one point. He would wear expensive suits. But after government whistleblowers uncovered a half a billion dollars worth of lies... It escalated in a way that we never could have imagined. Khan turns fugitive. Eric Khan cut off his electronic monitoring anklet and fled custody. Where is Eric Khan? leaving his desperate clients to face tragic consequences. He never cared about these people. And then when all hell broke loose, he never lifted a finger to help these people. There's nothing you can do to stop this. Nothing can fix this. Lexington, Kentucky. On June 3rd, 2017, Along a stretch of I-75, the Department of Probation and Parole recovers a gray backpack. Along with it, the severed electronic monitoring bracelet that's supposed to be wrapped around the ankle of attorney-turned-criminal Eric Kahn. Kahn, once one of Eastern Kentucky's most flamboyant characters, has just pled guilty to masterminding the largest Social Security fraud in U.S. history. He's been under house arrest, awaiting sentencing, and now he's vanished into thin air. We are looking for Eric Christopher Kahn. We need him to face justice for defrauding the U.S. taxpayer of more than $550 million in a Social Security fraud scheme. Clearly, he is desperate to escape punishment, and desperate people do desperate things. Disability attorney Eric Kahn hails from Floyd County in the heart of Appalachia, quintessential Kentucky coal country. The Industrial Revolution was powered by coal. So for years and years and generations and generations, this region dug coal. Kentucky, largest coal producer in the country. Eastern Kentucky, where most of that coal is mined. There are people who are in this region who know no other thing and would not do any other thing but mine coal. In Kentucky, they say mining coal is a boom or a bust business. It's been a bust around here lately. The decline of the coal industry has taken a toll on eastern Kentucky. And by the early 2000s, nearly a quarter of its population lives beneath the poverty line. Some of those counties have lost more than two thirds of their coal jobs. So there's a lot of folks there who don't have much money. And traditionally, disability has been a key source of income for folks. And there are a lot of folks who would qualify because you have a lot of injured people in the coal mines. For disability attorney Eric Kahn, opportunity abounds. Kahn has become a regional celebrity since he opened his law office in Stanville in 1993, in a trailer next to his mother's house. In the years since, he's come to be a master of self-promotion. Eric Kahn was probably the P.T. Barnum of the legal profession. You could not go anywhere in eastern Kentucky without seeing one of his billboards, big, bright yellow billboards, with a life-size mannequin of Eric Kahn sitting on top of it. He was the first lawyer who did saturation lawyer advertising. And there came a day, a day unlike any other in your life, American working heroes suddenly unable to work. Every single billboard, every single TV commercial, every single radio commercial, And not only was it saturation advertising, but it was colorful, outrageous, and I would say appalling. Khan hires beautiful women known around town as the Khan Hotties. Their job? To appear at events donning tight-fitting tank tops with Khan's phone number and moniker Mr. Social Security emblazoned across their chests. The Khan Hotties are accompanied by life-sized replicas of Eric Khan, cardboard cutouts of Eric Kahn, or sometimes even Eric Kahn himself. Lexington Herald leader reporter Bill Estep. A source told me that he was sort of a geek in high school, a kid who maybe was bullied, or at least not one of the popular kids by any stretch of the imagination. She believed that what drove him was 
proving to everybody that he was really better than them or smarter than them or more successful than them in the end. Featuring Mr. Social Security, Eric C. Kahn. Commercials like this one for Kahn services dominate local airwaves. Come with Eric C. Kahn to the future. 3D, it's here. In one outlandish episode, Eric Kahn claims to be the first attorney to ever create a 3D commercial, complete with instructions on how to make 3D glasses. Fellow Floyd County attorney Ned Pillersdorf cringes at Kahn's antics. It was just demeaning, made us look like hucksters, and it, it was just on such a low level. But some might say genius. Mr. Kahn was a very intelligent person. FBI's supervisory special agent, Donnie Kidd. We believe that he was a member of Mensa. As a matter of fact, he liked to brag that he was. And I talked to a couple of people who said that was true, as far as they could determine that he was, in fact, the IQ level of a genius. Kahn's approach translates into big bucks. Eric liked to show off how much he was worth. He had a home in Pikeville. He paid $1.5 million in cash for it. He had a Rolls Royce. He would wear expensive suits. Just flashy, just a very flashy person. He was pretty conspicuously wealthy. In 2010, Khan spends more than $500,000 to install a 19-foot replica of the Lincoln Memorial in the parking lot of his law office. He holds a special ceremony for its unveiling. He said that he had the statue commissioned because essentially he said he wanted to do something special and help put Stanville on the map. I think it was about promoting him. I think the statue was about as big as his ego. Khan demands attention, and attention is what he gets in the form of thousands of clients. People would line up. There'd be 50, 60 cars in the parking lot as early as 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, he was like the Pied Piper because people admired him so much because he was larger than life, and he was able to get people Social Security and these benefits. Well, I think at the end, clients went to him because he won. He never lost. I mean, wh why would you not go to him? You'd be crazy not to. For Emma Burchett's husband, Leroy Burchett, going to Khan is a last-ditch effort. A printing press crewman and former furniture delivery truck driver, Burchett is plagued with debilitating pain following two surgeries to fuse four discs in his neck that have slipped into his spine. He tries to keep working, but according to his wife, a neurosurgeon tells him if he continues and injures it again, he'll be paralyzed. You know, it's hard for any man, I would imagine, especially a man who's a father, you know, to have to succumb to all of a sudden not being the breadwinner for your family anymore. Nobody wants to go on the draw. But sometimes you have to. I mean, if you can't provide for your family, there's no other, no other way. Burchett applies for Social Security Disability Insurance and is turned down. That's where Eric Kahn comes in. They say you can't get your Social Security Disability. Hmm. Well, they don't know, you now have Mr. Social Security on your side. Burchett has seen Khan's commercials like this one. He knows a lot of people who have gotten their benefits through the Khan Law Office. You can't live in this area and not know about him. Everywhere you turn, there's a billboard. He was Mr. Social Security. Everybody knew that if you needed your Social Security, go to Eric Khan. According to Emma, Leroy goes to Khan's Law Office, now a whole series of trailers in Stanville. He never meets Khan, but he fills out paperwork and shortly after is scheduled to see a doctor at the law practice. They had a little room set up in the back and the doctor was back there in that examining room. Just four months after his visit to Khan's office, Burchett and his family received their first disability check. We were tickled to death. It was our way of surviving. It was our, you know, it's how we made our ends meet. 30-year-old Jason Damron also seeks disability benefits through Khan. Damron never wanted to depend on the government either, but it's what he has to do to support his family. I don't want to be sick. I don't want to tell the world I'm disabled. I had plans. I, you know, I wanted to build something in my life. But recent open heart surgery coupled with seizures, migraines, and a progressive birth defect in his hands and feet has left him unable to hold a steady job. At the suggestion of a family friend, Damron makes an appointment and goes to Khan's offices. 
oh wow and you know I don't, I don't i can't believe you haven't got it already you know I'm, this is you know you've got this going on and this and this and this and oh no this this should not be a problem a few months later damron gets a call to come back into the law offices for a medical exam look like any doctor's office you've ever been in cotton swabs in a glass container and tongue depressors and sat on the table and he you know gave me the brief physical listen to my heart and standing and lifting and i left the office and i was that was weird but oh, okay you know man's got a 50 foot abraham lincoln in his parking lot so i guess he can afford to have an in-house doctor on staff so what i assumed I, I i had no clue like burchett Damron never meets Khan himself. The truth is, I've met with hundreds of Khan clients. I've yet to meet the first Khan client who ever met Mr. Khan. But none of that matters when Damron receives his first check from the Social Security Administration. I felt human. I felt able. It was a relief. I knew if I got hungry, I could go get myself a meal. If my kids wanted to hang out. If I only put $5 in the gas tank and took them to the park, I could do that. For clients like Damron and Burchett, Khan is nothing short of a hero. But how is he winning so many cases? Does he just have a magic touch? Or could Khan be living up to his name? You've worked hard all your life. You've been through hell and back just to put food on the table. And now you just can't do it anymore. Thanks to an in-your-face marketing campaign, by 2010, attorney Eric Kahn is the third highest paid disability lawyer in the nation. He advertised he had a 99% success rate. The other social security lawyers were continuously griping, Eric's getting all my business and he's winning all these cases. Over the course of his career, Kahn secures $550 million in lifetime benefits for his clients. And for every case Kahn wins, He's paid by the Social Security Administration, the U.S. government, up to $6,000. In 2010 alone, Khan's firm rakes in $3.9 million in payments from Social Security. Khan's staggering success allows him to take overseas trips to exotic locales. He had gone to Central America. He had gone to South America. He had gone to Southeast Asia. He had traveled extensively around the world. There was some information in one court hearing that he had crossed international borders more than 100 times in 10 years. Often, he does not return alone. Khan has had at least half a dozen wives. And he was quite the womanizer. Women from all over the world. He was hardly ever in Floyd County. Most of the time, he was in Thailand or South America, marrying and, you know, summarily divorcing various foreign women. Appalachian newspapers publisher Jeff Vanderbeck. He introduced me to this woman, I don't remember her name. I said, hello, and, and how are you? Nice to see you. And he says, don't bother talking to her, she doesn't understand any English. Reporter Bill Estep. Typically, Khan married much younger women. He was in his late 40s, early 50s. Brides were early to mid 20s. And typically they lasted almost no time. The longest one that I remember was about a year and a half. And some lasted just a few weeks, a few months. One marriage lasted one day. He was in the Caribbean on vacation, married a woman there in the Caribbean and brought her back here. When he got home to Kentucky with her, that he sent her back. Eric Kahn is living a charmed, if odd, life. But 85 miles away from the Kahn Law Complex in Huntington, West Virginia, two employees at the Social Security Office of Disability Adjudication and Review, or ODAR, have started to notice some peculiarities in the way Khan's cases are being handled. In 2006, master docket clerk Jennifer Griffith is perplexed when disability cases that she's supposed to intake and assign to judges are disappearing. I was getting in trouble for information not being input correctly and cases not being docketed properly. But I really couldn't figure out exactly how that was happening initially. When Griffith takes it upon herself to start looking for the cases, she discovers they've been intercepted by administrative law judge David B. Doherty. Basically, Judge Doherty was going into our system and changing the status of a case and taking possession of a case. 
All of the cases that Doherty is taking have one thing in common. They're cases of claimants represented by Eric C. Kahn. Griffith's colleague, senior case technician Sarah Carver, herself has started to notice some unusual patterns that seem to connect Kahn and Doherty. Normally, we would only schedule for a judge in one day five cases, and Judge Doherty would hand you a pencil itinerary, and it would have sometimes up to 20 names, and they were the hearings were scheduled instead of an hour apart or an hour and 15 minutes apart, they were scheduled like 15 minutes apart. And nearly every decision Doherty issues for a con client is a favorable one. Some judges might have a 60% favorable, where there's some judges that have a 30 percent. It was unheard of that a judge would issue all favorable decisions. Carver and Griffith feel compelled to report to their supervisors what they've seen. But they say the response is not at all what they expected. Social Security heavily promotes this idea of see something, say something. I just simply thought that they would see the issue, they would take care of the issue, and it would be done. I never in a million years imagined that their response would be to become angry. But according to Griffith and Carver, that is exactly what happens. When I would question management regarding Eric Kahn, in turn, management would question me as to my work status and why I would have time enough to pull out those stats or to look at those um, reports. They would question my work. Over time, Griffith and Carver say, the more they question the relationship between Doherty and Khan, the worse the retaliation. I was followed, I had job retraining, I stopped getting promotions. The best example is when my group supervisor followed me around and timed every action that I did within a day, including going to the bathroom. It escalated in a way that we never could have imagined. Carver and Griffith say pressure on the office from the Social Security Administration to move quickly through cases is to blame. Judge Darty was a big contributing factor to our office's success. Judge Darty would hear 15 to 20, maybe even 30 cases a day for Mr. Khan, times that times five days a week. I think interrupting the conspiracy collusion, whatever you want to call it, between Eric Khan and Judge Darty meant a significant decrease in that office's numbers. According to Griffith, the stress of her work environment takes its toll on her health. In 2007, she makes the difficult decision to leave. It's really hard to walk away from this kind of job, but at the same time, your health is more important. And my physician said, if you do not do something about your stress level, you're going to die. In May 2011, after a tip from someone with knowledge of the Huntington, West Virginia, ODAR office, the Wall Street Journal publishes an article that questions whether Khan could be living up to his name. Its main sources, SSA employees Jennifer Griffith and Sarah Carver. The article spotlights the suspicious relationship between Eric Khan and Huntington, West Virginia disability judge David B. Doherty, who seems to be deciding favorably all of Khan's cases. Floyd County attorney Ned Pillersdorf. I vividly remember when the Wall Street Journal came out because it was a red flag that, hey, maybe there's an explanation of why this guy is winning 99% of his cases. Following the report, Doherty is placed on administrative leave and eventually retires. Khan goes on damage control. Social Security employee turned whistleblower Sarah Carver remembers being at a restaurant one day and seeing a stranger across the bar. I saw a gentleman videotaping me with his phone. And at first, we just kind of put our menus up to where he couldn't see, and he was still taping, and it was, it was obvious what he was doing. And I even held my phone up like I was videotaping him back, you know, just more or less making a joke of it at the time, and he left. That's when it hit me that there's something up. There's something going on. That something, Carver will later find out, is part of a retaliation plan hatched by Khan and Chief Administrative Law Judge Charlie Andrus, meant to silence Carver. And it was their plan to have an investigator follow me and try to show that I was not working at home on my work-at-home day. And they would try to use that 
to get me fired. And in essence, that would discredit any testimony that I was to give in this case. According to testimony from former Khan employees, someone from the Huntington ODAR office calls Khan's office with an alert every time Carver is scheduled to work from home. Carver is tailed for months, both during and after work hours. I mean, they terrorized Sarah. Carver and Griffith's attorney, Mark Wallander. Imagine, if you will, realizing that you, your children, your house is being stalked. And the reason they're stalking you is because they've got to destroy you. It makes me, even to this day, feel real paranoid. It was such an invasion of privacy that this man was following me, but not only following me, but following my friends, my coworkers, and my family. Judge Andrus will later plead guilty and serve six months for retaliation against a witness. He and Khan aren't able to get any incriminating evidence against Carver, but the evidence against Khan is mounting. Both the U.S. Senate and the Social Security Administration Office of Inspector General launch investigations. Other federal agencies, including the FBI, later join in. FBI forensic accountant Jennifer Ratterman. Um, we found several instances where there was a check that Eric Kahn wrote for cash. Then there were phone calls or a phone call between Doherty and Kahn. And then there was cash deposited into Doherty's bank account. The payments average anywhere from eight to $14,000 a month from 2004 to 2011. But as things come crumbling down, Khan's not going to let the government or the media have the last word. I got a question for you. For nearly 20 years, he's poured his blood, sweat, and tears into building his practice from the ground up. In July 2011, Khan releases a campy commercial to save face. That may not be the story you've heard from those who don't know the facts. But hasn't anyone said something about you that isn't true? And so he made that commercial where he's shown driving this expensive car, and then he pulls up to the office late at night. Eric. And there's a woman who says, we need you, Eric. We need you back. I never left. And you pretty much had to understand that he knew he was under investigation, and this was a response. Behind the doors of his law compound, attorney Eric Kahn knows he's under investigation. Khan hires a shredding company to destroy 26,000 pounds of documents. Special Agent Donnie Kidd. Khan ordered hard drives destroyed, and uh, we also had reports from witnesses that they made a huge bonfire in the back of the office where they burned records of his clients. And things are about to get worse for the Khan man. In October 2013, after a two-year investigation, the U.S. Senate holds public hearings examining nefarious activity at the Khan law firm. Hearing will uh, come to, uh, to order. We, uh, Khan has no choice but to go to Washington. But the panel of senators is not going to get anything out of Khan himself. I respectfully assert my constitutional right not to testify here today, sir. Raise your right hand, please. Unfortunately for Khan, Social Security whistleblowers Sarah Carver and Jennifer Griffith are there to testify, too. These women saw the disability programs being exploited and were brave enough to bring their story to the committee. It was astounding to me that not only was there what we reported, but there was a whole other layer of stuff that we didn't know anything about. Joining Carver and Griffith are former Con employees Jamie Sloan and Melinda Martin Hicks. According to testimony from Sloan and Hicks, every month from 2006 to 2011, administrative law judge David B. Doherty calls the Con law office with a list of Con clients that he is ready to approve. The list comes to be known as the DB list after Doherty's nickname, DB. He would give me the names of the individuals the first five numbers of their social security number and whether he wanted a mental or physical evaluation performed on the clients. Evaluations are performed by one of the doctors that Khan has in his pocket. He referred to those as whore doctors. He said that if they had sanctions and had their license suspended before, that he could get them to do whatever he wanted and they were cheaper to work with. Khan's doctors sign off on one of a handful of templates called Residual Functioning Capacity Forms, or RFCs, that Khan's firm has prefabricated and arbitrarily assigned to claimants. 
despite their actual conditions. All he had to do was put in the client's name and then the examining physician, and these forms would already have all the disability marks checked on it. But while false forms are submitted with their claims, many of Khan's clients are, in fact, truly disabled. They have no idea that Khan has used fraudulent means to win their legitimate cases. And when Khan is exposed as a fraud, the collateral damage is devastating. In May of 2015, the Birchett family receives a letter from the Social Security Administration. And I just about hit my knees. It said that all of his benefits were going to stop which meant no medical coverage, no prescription coverage, absolutely nothing. And I read the letter to him, and he just looks at me, and he says, well, what does that mean? And I said, I said, it, it means they've taken your Social Security away. So my husband's just in complete panic because, you know, everything's gone. He's just in complete panic. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I just, what are we going to do? Con client, Jason Damron. Office of the Inspector General notified the Social Security Administration. It's the same notice that 900 of Khan's clients receive. Therefore, we are suspending your benefits while we redetermine whether you were entitled to benefits. No warning, no, you know, brace yourself, no nothing. It's just, your livelihood's gone. <laughs> Have a nice day. Then it was panic. Emma Burchett's husband, Leroy, in addition to his physical ailments, also suffers from depression. With the loss of benefits, he falls into a deep decline. He wouldn't leave the house. He wouldn't get out of the bed. He said, I don't want to know. I don't want to know what's going on because it's, nothing's going to make this better. Nothing's going to fix this. It's a little over a week after they've received the letter. He got up that morning, and it was like he was a totally different person. He came through the house yelling and cussing at me and cussing at the kids. He was throwing things and kicking things. He was just crazy. I opened the door, and he was sitting on the edge of the bed with a gun. I took that gun away from him, and he said the same words to me again. He said, you're not going to stop this. Nothing can fix this. He stormed back outside. My kids were standing right there, and he said, I just can't take this. And he pulled another gun out from behind his back. And he shot himself in the chin. Following the letters, Floyd County Attorney Ned Pildersdorf is flooded with calls from desperate con clients. At that point, there was widespread panic in this community. We scheduled an emergency meeting of the Floyd Bar Association. I immediately filed a motion in federal court trying to get a court order to stop, to reinstate these people's benefits. And the word got out that suicides are contagious. Another con client takes her life the day after Burchett. Pillersdorf, with the help of Congressman Hal Rogers, is able to get benefits temporarily reinstated. But a total of 1,500 claimants must go through redetermination hearings. 150 volunteer lawyers from around the country pitch in. But Eric Kahn goes radio silent. Kahn had a brilliant business design, set up shop, do a lot of advertising in an area where we have a lot of people who are truly disabled. Bribe the judge, a corrupt judge. He made millions. And then when all hell broke loose, he never lifted a finger to help these people. Khan's clients are paying dearly for his fraud. The 19-foot Honest Abe statue presiding over the Eric C. Khan Law Office is about to take on an ironic twist. In April of 2016, Khan is indicted on 18 counts. He stands accused of bilking U.S. taxpayers out of more than half a billion dollars in lifetime Social Security benefits for his clients by bribing a judge and falsifying medical forms. Judge David B. Doherty is indicted on seven counts, accused of taking money from Khan in exchange for granting Social Security disability to all of Khan's clients. Prosecutors call it the largest Social Security fraud in U.S. history. I think we were all elated. Finally, after all these years of, of hollering and screaming to get something done, the indictment finally came in. 
Darty, who did not respond to an interview request, pleads guilty to two counts of accepting illegal gratuities and admits taking $609,000 in bribe money. He's eventually sentenced to four years and ordered to pay $93 million in restitution. And in March 2017, after nearly a year of negotiations, Khan pleads guilty as well to a two-count information of stealing from the government and paying illegal gratuities. Whatever else you think about Eric Connick, he's a smart guy and obviously a lawyer by training. The reality of what he could potentially get in terms of a sentence, the life sentence, trumped whatever ego might have been involved uh, for him. Khan's sentencing is scheduled for July. Until then, he's been placed on home detention with an electronic monitoring bracelet wrapped around his ankle. Part of the deal, Khan will testify against psychologist Alfred Bradley Atkins, who's accused of signing false medical forms on Khan's behalf. On Friday, June 2nd, Khan is given permission to travel to Lexington to meet with lawyers and prepare his testimony for Atkins' trial. He was cooperative, he was in a good mood, talkative, but gave no indication that something was getting ready to happen. But that is the last time anyone saw Eric Khan. Eric Kahn, the main defendant in this case, cut off his electronic monitoring anklet and fled custody. Friday evening, the Department of Probation and Parole receives an alert that Kahn's monitor has stopped transmitting. They locate it the next day. It's been severed and wrapped in metallic signal-blocking fabric in a backpack on the side of I-75 in Lexington. The Federal Bureau of Investigation confirms Stanville attorney Eric C. Kahn is considered to be on the run as a fugitive from justice. He was going to run. I mean, those of us that knew Eric, we all knew from the very outset when he was released on home monitoring on an ankle bracelet that it was just a matter of time. Eric Kahn, being a narcissist, spent most of his life as a world traveler. It was a totally predictable event. The FBI puts Kahn on its most wanted list offering a $20,000 reward for information on his whereabouts. Then the emails start arriving. A week after Khan's disappearance, Lexington Herald leader reporter Bill Estep receives a message from someone purporting to be Khan. Having a fugitive send you an email is so bizarre that I didn't believe it. My initial reaction was that this was a police officer, an FBI agent, somebody that I know pulling a prank on me. But this is no prank. Sent from an untraceable address, it's the first of several messages that Khan sends on the run. I thought it was nuts, but I also thought it was a great example of Khan's ego. I mean, he, you know, even though he's on the run, he still wants to try to control the story. He wants to try to get his side of the story out. The first email has conditions for Khan's surrender. One of his conditions was he wanted the FBI to say that he wasn't dangerous. He said, I would never hurt anybody, and that he wanted them to confirm that he wasn't dangerous. And then there was another email where he asked me to stop using this unflattering mugshot of him. And he said, you know, I think you've made your point. You know, I, I didn't look great in that shot. And he asked us to begin using another uh, photograph of him. In the emails, Khan claims he flew out of the U.S. the day of his disappearance using a fake passport and is hiding out in a country without an extradition treaty. But that proves to be a red herring. On June 4th, two days after vanishing, security cameras capture images of Khan at a gas station and a Walmart in New Mexico. The following day, the Luna County, New Mexico Sheriff's Department finds a truck suspected to be Khan's escape vehicle abandoned near the Mexico border. But there is no sign of Khan himself. It seems he is long gone. And I was frankly convinced they would have a hard time finding Khan. It took 16 years for the FBI to find mafia hitman Whitey Bulger. Khan's smarter than Whitey Bulger. Eric, we need you back. I never left. Six years later, attorney Eric Kahn's 2011 commercial is now the punchline of jokes. Contrary to one of his more popular advertisements, he left. Kahn has successfully evaded the FBI and remained a fugitive for months. We need Eric Kahn to face justice. We need him to come back and be accountable for his actions. 
while on the lam, he's sentenced in absentia to 12 years in prison in order to pay $170 million in restitution for orchestrating the largest social security fraud in U.S. history. Psychologist Alfred Bradley Atkins is convicted of fraud and making false statements and sentenced to 25 years for his role in the scheme, despite the absence of key witness Khan. FBI Supervisory Special Agent Donnie Kidd. Just putting aside the $550 million in potential loss that the government could have suffered because of him, the damage that he did to Eastern Kentucky and to the citizens, we had to bring him in. He had to face justice for what he did. Three months after Khan's disappearance, his employee, Curtis Wyatt, is indicted for aiding Khan's escape. The indictment alleges a plan a year in the making and accuses Wyatt of securing Khan's escape vehicle and making pedestrian crossings into Mexico to test border security. Wyatt pleads not guilty and is awaiting trial. Khan's whereabouts become the subject of much speculation around Eastern Kentucky. It was an opportunistic idea that I came up with to create a betting pool, said, where is Eric Khan? And all the money went to the animal shelter. It was interesting, the overwhelming amount of money was bet on that he's still in Kentucky, and people would always come up to you and said, well, he always said he never left. Nobody bet on Honduras. On December 2nd, 2017, in the coastal town of La Ceiba, Honduras, a middle-aged Caucasian man sits down at a pizza hut for a meal of pepperoni pizza and Azteca soup. When he emerges, a masked Honduran SWAT team brandishing machine guns awaits and takes into custody one Eric Christopher Kahn. It's six months to the day after he fled. It does seem kind of an anticlimactic end after being on the run for six months to be arrested coming out of a pizza hut. Somebody said it could only have been better if it had been at a Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> Three days later, a government plane lands at Bluegrass Airport in Lexington, Kentucky. FBI agents are there to greet a frail-looking con and haul him off to finally face the music. When they brought him off the plane at the airport, he looked a little bit befuddled. Not exactly confused, but kind of bewildered. He did not look happy to be back. How's it feel to be back? Today, I'm pleased to announce that Mr. Khan is in custody. As promised, Mr. Khan will now be held accountable for his actions, the people he deceived, and the lives he shattered. Khan is now at the Grayson County Detention Center in Litchfield, Kentucky, beginning his 12-year sentence. Facing additional charges related to his escape, Khan takes a plea deal. In all, he is facing up to 27 years behind bars. He thinks he's smarter than everybody else, and I think that was his downfall. He made a lot of mistakes as a result of thinking that nobody would ever catch him. In a letter to American Greed, Khan writes, I once had money to fly around the world, rent entire clubs, drive Rolls Royce, and so much more. Now I am sitting in a cell having to write letters on tissue paper. The irony or poetic justice of my situation does not escape me. I hope others can learn not to make the mistakes I did. Around Eastern Kentucky, Eric Kahn's flashy billboards are all but gone. But the memory of his con job will haunt those who live here for generations to come. When he was caught, there was that little ha-ha moment that, you know, karma. After his hearing, Jason Damron's benefits are not reinstated. Instead, he gets an $87,000 bill from the Social Security Administration for back pay. Khan's capture makes little difference. You know, everybody wants that self-satisfying vengeance when they feel they've been wronged or hurt. I got that for a moment. But then it just fell back to reality of, what's it going to change? Attorney Ned Pillersdorf is still fighting to get Social Security benefits restored to 800 of Khan's clients. He posts Eric Khan fiasco updates to his Facebook page several times a week. Mental health professionals said, Ned, people commit suicide when they think they're being abandoned. The Eric Khan fiasco updates I post on my Facebook page. One of the main reasons I do this has been really, number one, suicide prevention. Number two, to let these people know what's going on and to let the people know they're not being abandoned. 2,000 more Khan clients are being notified that they'll be put through hearings. 
For the Birchett family, life will never be the same. No matter what happens, my children are going to grow up without their father. Neither of my four girls are ever going to get walked down the aisle without to buy their daddy. And it was all because of him. I could care less what happens to that man. The Christian in me cares about his soul. But the human side of me tells me that he ought to burn in hell for what he's put people through. Thanks for listening to the American Read Podcast presented by CNBC. I'm Stacy Keach.